Point Tiburon Rail Hub was established in 1884. Passenger operations were centered around the depot known as the Donahue Building, which is the main surviving structure of the railroad today. Since 1995, it's been home to a museum which includes a detailed scale model of railroad operations in 1909, the height of passenger and freight traffic in Tiburon. The rail yard covered 43 acres, all reclaimed land. The museum's model covers just 400 square feet. Here is Main Street Tiburon in 1909 and now faithfully recreated on the model. For more than 80 years, locomotives were maintained in the roundhouse and now you see it in HO scale. A view of the main line going north and as shown on the model. A ferry boat has just arrived to meet the morning 943 train number three bound for Ukiah. Imagine yourself in 1909 hurrying down the ramp and hearing the conductor announce, all aboard. Let's board the train and begin our journey. Back in 1909, 10 passenger trains a day left this terminal. Some 1.2 million passengers traveled through Tiburon that year. And the noise was never ending. Bells clanged and whistles blew all day long. Train number three passes a track gang at work. Now we are approaching the roundhouse and workshops. A freight train is leaving the schooner pier after an ocean-going ship has unloaded its cargo. In 1909, some 350,000 tons of freight moved through this terminal. From inside the roundhouse, an engine enters the turntable for maintenance. Northbound trains steam through the rail yards, heading for Ukiah over 100 miles away. This rail yard filled with smoke and the smell of bunker oil employed some 350 people. Meanwhile, the work train heads out onto the main line. The ride was really as bumpy as it looks. It approaches the workshops and heads towards the paint shop, the building on the right. Time for a new shiny coat of paint. A steam engine enters the paint shop. Freight from the north approaches through the freight yard, past homes of the workers and their families. Some of these homes can be seen in Tiburon today. This old passenger car served as a Sunday school. How different Main Street Tiburon looked over 100 years ago. The two towers, known as the gallows, enabled the apron to move up and down so the rail cars could roll on the ferry, whatever the tide. It's a tight fit as the cars go inside the boat bound for Pier 43 in San Francisco. Visitors, young and old, enjoy Tiburon's Rail and Ferry Depot Museum. We invite you to come and view this history of Tiburon in miniature. To start this off. So, the only reason we have a town of Tiburon is the railroad. 
Before the railroad, we had 7,000 cows and 1,000 sheep here. Very few trees, lots of grazing land. No buildings, nothing was down here. And so Peter Donahue extended his railroad from San Rafael to Tiburon, eventually to San Francisco over the water in 1884, and that's where the town of Tiburon started. Still no buildings until 1887, but there was a dock and there was a walkway and a place for passenger cars. That's how we started. May 1st, 1884, first train out of here to San Rafael. Now, all this land that, that was here, this is a picture of the John Reed land grant. So in 1834, John Reed received 7,800 acres from Mexico or New Spain, depending how you look at it. Uh, they were trying to populate the area here because the Russians were coming down from the north. So they wanted to populate the area going toward them. Uh, so this picture shows from Mount Tam all the way to the end of the land here in Tiburon was the John Reed land grant plus a big chunk of Corte Madera. So if you look up in here, this is all filled in today, but that's all wetlands we call them today, swamps originally. And so that's how we got started. Now this is an interesting picture. Um, this is the trestle, way, way back when. What was the date of this, Phil, roughly? This is about 18, 1883. Now you'll notice that little white building down at the bottom of the trestle. That was the original Reed School. And it was for the uh, children of the dairy workers, the Reed Dairy Farm. And uh, there's an interesting story about that. What, what was the name of the teacher? Bertha Bulldog Leeds. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently not a, a, a lovely lady to be up front of this if you misbehave. <laughs> anyway, um, the, a lot of the kids were coming down from way behind, uh, way behind the hills where the, where the Reed Ranch was, and they would come down on the railroad tracks, and they had to go through a tunnel. And if a train came, it was a bit of a problem. Today there'd be a lot of child endangerment suits. But uh, back then they had these very large uh, wood pillars which held up the tunnel. And she would say, hit the wood. And the kids would brace themselves up against the wall between the pillars and the train would go by and then they would continue their way to school. So <laughs> it was, uh, it, like I say, today that probably wouldn't be allowed. Phil? So this is uh, the second big boat we built here. This is, uh, or this one actually is the... Uh, it's the Donahue. The Donahue. Okay, this one was not, was built in the Potrero. And it was built in 1875. It ran from the ferry building all the way up to Petaluma. Not really there. It's really Lakeville near Donahue Landing. So nobody knows where Donahue Landing is, but Lakeville you might know. And that ran, that took two hours to get from the ferry building to Donahue Landing. So that's why Peter Donahue wanted to get a closer jumping off point, which was Tiburon. So this is our early, early layout. So we had a walkway here, we had a slip, and that was about it. And you notice this big cliff here. So today, that's a very gentle hill right now. And you see the first part, it's all been dynamited. So all of the flat land around here is filled in land. And so it was done twice. One in the 1883-84 time frame where they did most of the land fill around here. And then in 1913, they blew off even more of that cliff to fill in the land and make the walkway straight. So if you go from downtown Main Street to the museum, it's a straight walk. That's when they made it straight in 1913. This is the ugly duckling of all the ferry boats. So this is the Lagunitas. It was designed by the Sausalito Railroad, the North Pacific Coast, and it was launched in 1903. Uh, it's not very aesthetic. It's like a bunch of boxes on a barge. It was not well built because they forgot to seal the underside with copper plates. And we have these things in the water called shipworms. Shipworm is actually a clam about this big with a two-foot siphon and an ability to digest wood. 
So it would go and scrape wood off, eat it. And so that was eaten up, and by 1917, the thing could hardly float. So that had a short life. This is our original slip. And we saw a, a part there where we had the walkway and the archway. And notice the way the slip is built. You don't have to be a very good pilot to get in here. If you could hit this on the side or hit it over on the other side, you could bounce all the way in. <laughs> and the ferry boats were built such that their end matched the end of the slip. So once you stopped, you were docked. You were done. You kept the wheels going very slowly. Now, the building that we see today is parts of a former building. Originally, it was a one-story building, clear span. There were no posts or anything in it. And this is a picture of that. And you see the modern motive force here of a horse. And here's the walkway toward the slip. Uh, around 1895 or so, we added a second story. And that's where the posts and the beams came inside. But originally, you could drive a horse team into the uh, depot, unload your pack passengers and such, turn them around, and drive out the other side. So that's how it was built. Uh, in 1887, a lot of material was brought down from Donahue Landing. One more famous part was this little building here. That's currently the paint shop is what it was for the Tiburon. But originally, it was the machine shop up at Donahue Landing. And a couple of interesting things. This shows our boats in here. But I don't know if you can see this, but this is a big coal bunker. So the ferry boats burned coal until 1905. The engines burned wood, and we'll talk about that later until 1905. At that point, we converted everything to fuel oil. And so by our museum, even today, we have a diver that goes down there. Uh, there's a huge coal pile to the left of the museum in the water, underwater. So I think what happened is when they converted the ferry boat, shoved the coal over the side, and that was it. So this is our fancy shed. The local newspapers wrote in 1884 about Peter Donahue's amazing shed for passengers. It kept the rain off, but you notice it's open air. So the fog that we have, fog season starts in about two weeks and just rolls right inside of it. So that's what. And this train here, the one stuck outside, that was the Calistoga train. It never got into the shed. It was a, a joint venture from Southern Pacific and the Northwestern Pacific. And it ran for a while up towards Sonoma and then cut across to Southern Pacific tracks to Calistoga. And you'll notice on the top of the roof at the ridge, those barrels. That was the fire prevention system. And nobody to this date knows exactly how it was supposed to work, whether there were ropes you would pull that would uh, drop the 55 gallons down. But they ran the entire length of the roof up on top. So here's another view of the shed. And it gives you an idea. Here's a, a wood-burning engine, some of the people here. But again, there's not much protection against the weather except for rain, and that's about it. But the trains would come in. And so here's the Ukiah itself. So it was built and launched in May of 1890, built here in Tiburon. They only built two big boats. You'll see a picture of another one later uh, here. Uh, we built a lot of boats, moderate size, up to 60 feet or so, but nothing like this. This was about 300 feet long, the biggest, fastest ferry boat in the world at the time. And it had rail tracks in it. It could hold 10 freight cars. Now those are shorties, 36-foot cars, and about 2,300 people. If you cleared everybody out, you could get toward 1,000 people in the, on the boat. And you'll notice there is on the front and the rear a cabin for the, um, for the, for the captain. It's called a double ender. And the advantage of that compared to what we have today is that you didn't have to come out, swing the thing around to go back to San Francisco. The captain would just run from the cabin he was in to the other one, hop in, and take off. So it made life a lot easier. 
and a number of the ferries that were running back at the time were double enders. And this is the tag that shows that our boat was made in Tiburon. So that's the piece of documentation everybody searches for. So this is the Del Norte. This is the only photograph of this boat. It was about 190 feet long. That was the second boat we built, launched in December of 1890. And that was the end of our large boat building experience here in Tiburon. Uh, this is the only photo at the Bancroft Library of the boat anywhere. So here, as you see, a variety of boats and ferries. So this is the Lagunitas here. Uh, this is probably the Ukiah here. Looks like it, yeah. And you see we have a second story on our building now. So this is at around 1895, 1896. That's when we added the second story. We added the post in the first floor to support the floor. And so that changed the nature of the building. That building housed the telegraph office for Southern Marin. It housed Railway Express, which is predecessor to FedEx, UPS, all those DHL, and it was a waiting room uh, for passengers. And here's our boat taking off, so we're leaving the slip. Here's our nice archway, so when you came into Tiburon, it was kind of a big deal. They had a very nice archway and walkway to get in there. And what's left of that are these two, you can see these at low tide, two piers that support it the walkway. So now this is the Eureka. So the Ukiah became the Eureka in 1922 when they took out the rail tracks, made it acceptable for automobiles, and increased the passenger load. The Eureka today is in the Maritime Museum on Hyde Street. And uh, I understand it's going to get rehabbed up in Vallejo. It needed it very badly. It would hold 140 automobiles about 2,500 passengers, and if you cleared all the cars out, you could take about 3,600 people on it. And when it ran from the ferry building to Sausalito, it ran full on the weekends. There was one passenger manifest for Tiburon on a weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 70,000 people came through our little depot. Another interesting thing about this ferry um, you think it's big, it's large, it's going to be a lot slower than the existing ferries today. I think this one could make it to the city in 23 minutes, and I think the current ones are like 21 or 22 minutes. Yeah. S uh, no, a little bit, a uh, couple minutes faster. So the bottom line is this was a very fast boat. And back in the day, there were competitors to Donahue, and so they would have races to see who could get the ferry across the, uh, across the bay the quickest. But this, considering its size, is an amazing vessel, how fast it could go and how many people it could hold. So if you were caught racing on a boat, you, the captain would get one demerit. If he lost, he'd get two demerits. <laughs> so this is our waterfront, and you see Old St. Hillary Church up here. This is the, the newer school, so the playground's in the background. Uh, and uh, several of our guests here lived right up around here. So this is Esperanza, this is Mar West, and you lived on Central West. The Brooks family, raise your hand. Where's Maggie? They're all, they're all look at that. There they are. <laughs> so here's your wood burner. Yeah, let me, let me describe the difference between this and the oil burners that came down a little bit later in, in 1956. The way you can tell a wood burner primarily is the stack. And that stack has a purpose. It's, it's a spark arrester. These trees went from here all the way up to Ukiah, and of course they went through all the redwood and all the other forests along the way, a lot of which are now Highway 101. But back in the day, if that stack didn't have the spark arrester on it, uh, they had a major fire problem. So the way you can always tell a wood burner is that it has that kind of that uh, I don't know what you would call it, recta not rectangular, but anyway, that conical uh, diamond stack. Uh, stack. And the oil burners are really boring. They look, the stacks for them look kind of like the two uh, things going behind. They're about this high and this high. So one of, the, one of the conversions was they took that out. They also put um, 
as opposed to the, in beneath they had um, basically tubing uh, for the boiler and they had to put a burner in there for the oil as opposed to throwing in wood. It was a lot easier, I, I would assume it was a heck of a lot easier to, uh, for the firemen to run these trains as opposed to what it was back in the days of wood. So here's another wood burner uh, by our building. You look at this little building here. This was the telegraph office. And so if you had to send a message to somebody and you didn't want to put it in the mail, but make it quicker there by telegraph, you come down here and you give it to the telegraph operator and they would send it out for you. So this photo is interesting because it's an older area. This is our, remember that coal bunker? It's empty now. So this is after 1905. Uh, look it up here, though. There's a bunch of wood there. Those are the ways. So this is 1890, late. This is Those are the ways for building the Del Norte and the Ukiah. So this is a very specific time frame. And you notice there's no slip or anything. So when they launched the boat, it just went down the beach and out, and they caught it before it went out the gate. You laugh, that was a real concern. <laughs> uh, these cars are kind of interesting. These are open air excursion cars. So there's for folks on the weekend to be able to have a little trip up to the railroad and uh, to San Rafael and you'd be sitting in an open air car and uh, have a nice time. So here's downtown Tiburon, Main Street. So this building is the old Tiburon Boathouse. It burned down in 1906. So Mary McDonough owned it. She's the great grandmother of Maggie McDonough who runs the ferry boat from Angel Island to Tiburon back and forth. Uh, so Mary, after the fire in 1906, got this rebuilt in two months. Try that today. <laughs> uh, here's all the, the Sonoma Hotel. So that I, we know burned down in 1906. So all this area in 1906 burned. We had three big fires, 1890, 1906, and 1921. And the other thing to notice about this picture is look at all of the smoke. This was not a, a, a nice place to live back then. It just reeked of smoke and steam and noise and all the rest. So this is a nice shot of multiple ferry boats in here. So this is the Lagunitas, the ugly one. This is the Ukiah, and this is the Donahue here. Uh, and You'll notice on the uh, station, you can see the large wide door. That was where you could, in the, in the old days, bring your horses in and unload and then bring them back out again. Now I like this shot because it shows ocean going traffic. So these kind of boats, would go up and down the California and Oregon coasts and pick up lumber and do uh, various other things, moving passengers. So they had cabins here. And I have a photograph of a board hooked to a, what we call a zip line today with four passengers in their luggage in Mendocino going 100 feet up to a cliff to Mendocino. And I'm sure when they got on the boat, they weren't told how they were going to disembark. And this shot shows us, again, our slip. So remember, we built the boat here, and there was no slip. So this is would be later, 1891, where we built the slip for the Ukiah. So the Ukiah was built with railroad tracks, but it had nowhere to pick up rail cars here until that slip was built. Again, we have the old shops here, the Sonoma Hotel here, and the Brown House over this area. These let me just point out one other thing. These little critters here, these things that guide the boat, are called dolphins. And that's what guides the boat in. So remember on the passenger slip, you didn't have to be too smart. You could just bounce your way in. This one's a little tougher. You had to know what you were doing to get into this one. So this is the Palachi Ark, which is up the hill on Mar West in the backyard of a home and it's a rental today. 
So it still exists, and it's on our model. These two, these are duplexes, cottages brought down from Donahue Landing. He brought four of them down on a barge in 1887 to start building up the town. And this is where families would s uh, reside. And uh, they burned down in 1921 also. And here's the photograph of the 1906 fire where everything on the waterfront except for one lone building over there is pretty much burned down. So anybody who claims to have a building that's still around prior to 1906 in Tiburon is, mi yeah, mistaken. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> uh, here's a later shot of Main Street, the Tiburon Boathouse, which uh, Mary owned. And uh, we've got a bunch of uh, pool halls, bars, you name it. We had every vice known to anybody here. So the, the boathouse that Mary owned, that was now Waypoint Pizza, is it not? Yes, in the well, front. Uh, upstairs there was a business that we don't talk about in Polite Company. And we get a lot of visitors, some of whom now I believe it's a, uh, a bed and breakfast or a hotel upstairs. Yeah, you rent rooms. And renters. And uh, they come and visit us and we tell them what was going on upstairs when <laughs> before they arrived. But it, this town was a railroad town. It was a rough and woolly and ready town. I mean, they, they, a lot of drinking and a lot of, a lot of carousing going on because these guys worked hard and they played hard. So we have a docent, Fred Cadoni. He was a dispatcher here in 1953, so he's a mature citizen. But uh, he uh, has some stories of finding his firemen and engineers in various buildings of the around the town <laughs> doing various things, <laughs> and he would haul them back and put them in their train and get them going. Uh, this is a great shot of uh, our building and the waterfront, but there's one structure right here. See this big tall thing? That's the pile driver. So pilings lasted between 30 and 35 years. If you put brass sheets around them, We'll show you something that happened to some guy that forgot those. Uh, so that guy was the probably the busiest. The, the pier that our building stood on, this one here, had 1,300 pilings in it. So you can imagine how much work it took to keep that going. A lot of dirt, uh, dirt everywhere. Ah, there's something, you wanna talk about that one? Oops. <laughs> This is 1913, and Phil was just describing what happened uh, when this uh, pier was built. They didn't uh, plate it with brass. So the uh, shipworms got down there, and they had a field day, and poor old number uh, 112 went into the drink. The scary thing is that the engineer and the fireman went down with it. I guess one of them got out, didn't they? And the fireman, and yeah. And he dove in and literally cut the engineer free. Apparently a strap got caught on some of the valves inside the engine and saved him. So uh, it was it was quite a deal. And I think there's another picture following up. Yeah, that's another view of it. Yeah. <laughs> and it turns out that 112 uh, was restored, and, and, and you'll see pictures of it later. They kind of tarted her up. And she currently is up at the, s at the Sacramento Rail Museum, and you can actually see her climb on board if she's out uh, to be uh, displayed. She's got a green and silver and kind of gold paint job. <laughs> so she doesn't look like she did back in the day. I think we have a picture of her. No, we don't. So what we do have another picture of her when she was still yeah. the way she used to be. Do you want to talk about the gallows? Yeah, so this is how we adapted to our tides. This is called the gallows frame. This area down here with the tracks is the apron. And what we did is if you came in at low tide, you would have to lower the apron to match up where the barge was. If you came in at high tide, you would raise it. These big wheels up here held counterweights. So you see this big counterweight here and this one there? Uh, so those would make this essentially weigh zero. And so the weight of the rail cars on the barge was what was left to be supported. The small wheels ran up and down so we could go raise and lower it. Originally, they had a large water tank that was attached to the small wheels, 
And if they wanted to raise the uh, apron, they would fill the tank with water, and it would pull down, and the apron would go up. And if they wanted to lower it, they dropped water out of the tank. Eventually, they put an electric motor on the whole operation, and it's much more efficient. Oh, by the way, tell them what the weight of those wheels were, by the way. Oh, yeah, the big ones are 8,500 pounds. And we had, uh, when we moved them, uh, we had a b huge backhoe, and we flattened the tires on the backhoe <laughs> with those. Uh, the small ones are 500 pounds. Uh, they've been stolen once or twice, so there's some pretty big folks around that like to steal stuff, <laughs> heavy stuff. So this is our first station out of Tiburon itself. It's at the police station. So this is, uh, in, uh, yeah, Hilarita. Yeah. So Hilarita was the daughter of John and Hilaria Reed. And so Hilarita means little Hillary, I, I figure. And uh, that was a milk stop. And so uh, that's the only plant time that they would pick up anything. This is the Reed station. Reed Station is near Bel Air School. So if you ever go to Bel Air School to a function there, as you come in the driveway, you'll notice there's a hill on each side of it. That supported a trestle that went over the top. So the tracks went basically over the top of the driveway, made a right turn, and went up through a tunnel to Corner Madera. This uh, was a station up on um, the Russian River for the Bohemian Grove. Um, we had a spur which went along the Russian River all the way out to Duncan Mills for lumber. And uh, when the Bohemian Grove was established, uh, some wag decided, why don't we put a couple of uh, passenger cars on the back end of those lumber cars and we can go up there and basically be dropped off. I can imagine the condition those guys must have been in when they, when they hit the Grove. <laughs> uh, two to three hour train trip from down here. Um, this is actually in the Grove. I took this picture. This is a, at a camp called Tunerville, uh, and I tr pleaded with them to get give it to us for the museum, and they, they want to hold on to it. So if you look at some of our older schedules, they actually have in July the schedule for the uh, Grove trains going up and coming back. So this is my daughter on tunnel number two, which uh, in if you go to Via Capistrano, uh, which is off of Blackfield, and so that uh, house at the end of the cul-de-sac owns to the tunnel. They worked a deal with Southern Pacific to have a pie-shaped lot and then a big panhandle to go through the tunnel. So we walked up there, and I asked her if she could crawl into it, and it's pretty well caved in, so she couldn't really do it. <laughs> She's grown up a lot more since that. <laughs> So this is a ferry boat that ran from Sausalito to Belvedere to Tiburon, and that's it, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, it was a flat bottom boat, carried about 90 passengers, and if everybody went over to one side to look for something, the whole boat would tip over. <laughs> but the dock for the on Belvedere is still there for, for that boat. And the reason why they were running this ferry between Sausalito and Tiburon is that passenger traffic was stopped. What was it, 1909? The end of 1909. Yeah, so so if you wanted to go to Tiburon, you had to take a ferry to Sausalito, then hop on this guy, and he would bring you over to Tiburon or Belvedere. So here's another picture of our downtown. And y we have uh, these little buildings here. So these are all bunkhouses for railroad workers. And our thought is that they probably had six to eight cots in them, a uh, stove, and a coffee pot, and that's about it. So the guys would wake up, have a cup of coffee, go to work, go to the bar, come back home, go to sleep, and do it again. That would be life here in the rail yard. The same, a different picture. Uh, all right, and here's the second school. So they built two Tiburon schools, and what they did is they flopped the playground to the front and the back, depending on which school it was. So here is our telegraph operations. 
we actually have this repeater in the museum. We have our own repeater. This guy's writing down what he hears or what he translates. But this is William Bent, this guy with the big mustache there. So he's the guy that was the first station master, and he arrived with his family in 1913. So the job of a station master came with a home. So the second floor of our building, which originally was offices, was turned into a home. So when you come to the museum, we take you upstairs and show you the house, 1920 to 1930. What's fascinating is everything up there works, 100 years old. Yeah, and his youngest daughter uh, helped restore the- Florence, uh, yeah. Florence, and she had another interesting thing. She danced uh, in the San Francisco Opera Ballet. So she would hop on the ferry and head over to San Francisco and do her thing, whether it's the, the rehearsals or class or performances, and then come home. And uh, she was you know, really the pet of the yard. The second thing that's interesting about the telegraph, no matter where you were on the line, whether it was Santa Rosa, Ukiah, Salt Lake City, especially the local ones, you could tell who was on that key. They had a certain touch. and. With that touch, they could say, oh, this must be coming in from Santa Rosa until, of course, it was announced where the, where the uh, message was coming from. So these guys all had their own little individual touch, and they could identify who was on the other end. You could imagine when Florence went to the ballet class, if you were the captain of the ferry boat, and this was the boss's daughter, <laughs> you had to watch your P's and Q's for sure. <laughs> so this is Tiburon... What, what do we figure this was, Bill? Eight 20 1920s? Yeah, late 20 20s. to 30s. Yeah. So you begin to see the horses' carriages down the street. And this is probably the 30s. Those look like 30 automobiles. And that's near Sam's, isn't it, Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, do you want to tell this one or do you want me to? Go ahead. This is the two prison cars and the guard car that brought Al Capone to Alcatraz. Al Capone was supposed to come to Oakland, which is where the main uh, railroad line from back east comes, get on a ferry there and be trundled over to Alcatraz. But there were rumors that they were going to try to break him out at the Oakland. So what they did was they hauled the train around the top through Vallejo, down the uh, Marin Peninsula and into Tiburon. <laughs> and Al the last uh, land that uh, Al Capone saw before Alcatraz was Tiburon. You'll notice the cars, the, the first two cars have all chain link fence over the windows, so they'd be pretty difficult to get out. The car in the back was where the guards ran. So this is literally when he is being unloaded at Alcatraz. So this is a little switch engine that would move cars onto the barge or onto the ferry. Uh, one of the more interesting things is we've got this huge tank up here. That's our 670,000 gallons of fuel oil. That powered the boats and it powered the train. The railroad owned the boats, owned the trains. This is a vertically integrated transportation system. Was the foundation for that oil tanker still up there on the hill? Uh, the, the retaining wall is, yeah. yeah. The parking lot. And this is our building. Notice the water and mud and crud and everywhere. It's uh, not too uh, romantic, I'll tell you. <laughs> and when you got off the boat, you would get off on the other side of the station, walk through this to get to the loading area for the train. So it was when it was raining, it was pretty pretty yucky. So this is around 1930. Uh, shows us all of our activity in the rail yard. Here's the town, Main Street. Shortest Main Street in the U.S., 450 feet. Uh, here's our building here. It still has the 35 feet that was missing now. Look at this scar on the... So in 1913, they blew off more of this cliff and made this line straight. So when you walk from downtown to our building, it's a straight path. And there, of course, on the end of uh, is, the, is the Corinthian Yacht Club, and that, that building has been around for quite a while. 
And look, at not, not a lot of homes and stuff around there. Sorry, let me go back. What were you going to say again, Phil? Just not a lot of homes and stuff no. around here. And the other thing that Phil continually reminds me of, there are no trees. And everybody yeah. says uh, they, bl they accuse the early people being in here of logging it, of, of clear-cutting it. It's not the case. It's on the windward side. If you go on the other side, of course, on the paradise side, it's loaded with trees. So the reason why there are no trees here is just because they don't like the, the salt, cold salt wind coming at them. So uh, we had a great electric railway system that ran from Manor, which is north of Fairfax, by about a mile and a half, all the way to Sausalito, going through uh, Larkspur and Ross and San Anselmo, Mill Valley, down to Sausalito. Ran from 1903 to February 28th, 1941. This is the card they gave you on February 28th that said, have a nice trip today because we're not operating tomorrow. And that was the end of the electric line. We had a very great inner urban, inner urban system. And uh, we were electrified before New York electrified their subway. And about a year after Chicago electrified theirs. So it was a joint venture of PG&E and the railroad to set this up. Uh, my aunt went from Fairfax to her office in San Francisco where she was an accountant, 45 minutes. Try to go from Fairfax to 101 in 45 minutes. The other interesting thing, they had um, a, a the, the, what they call, I guess, the school train, which basically yeah. uh, they would run uh, high school kids from Fairfax all the way down to uh, Tam High. And they had a boy's car and a girl's car. There was going to be no fraternizations <laughs> between, uh, between home and school and back. So this is a view with our new, remember we had a big fire in 1921 that burned down all the shops. Did not burn the roundhouse. The roundhouse caught fire three times and we put it out three times. But this is our new corrugated steel building and uh, here's something that's interesting. I don't know if you can see this line. This is Tiburon Boulevard, it's a, a dirt path. So it was uh, dedicated in 1936. All these, all these homes are still here. We modeled these on uh, a rail yard model. Another thing about the fire, uh, they aren't quite sure. There were two fires in Tiburon in 21. One was the rail yard, and a separate fire was the town itself. The rail yard, they're not quite sure if it was a piled oil rags or a spark or something. The town fire <laughs> started when somebody's still blew up. <laughs> so, and uh, what, what, what was the comment from the owner of that still? The, the owner in the newspaper, the owner sheepishly said, it may have been me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was during Prohibition, just in case you didn't yeah. catch that there. <laughs> Uh, here's a, f a shot from the 50s, late 40s. This is the automobile ferry. Uh, here's the records building, which still is around. Uh, I believe it's up for sale again. So it goes up for sale every couple of years. And uh, a couple old, of old St. Hillary's up uh, on yeah, top. Yeah, right, old St. Hillary's. And notice, not a lot of things going on in the hills there. <laughs> And again, the shot of the rail yard. Uh, we brought a lot of logs through in these gondola cars. But see these passenger cars here? So one of our former fire chiefs, Frank Busher, was an electrician in the rail yard. And they would deadhead passenger cars from San Rafael to here. He would work on their electrics and get them all ready for the next day. And they'd run them back up to San Rafael and load passengers and go on from there. And here's loading a passenger car onto the gallows frame. We didn't ever really purposely send any rail passenger cars on the barges, but we think this one has to do with a celebration in Larkspur, where they were uh, had a centenary or some kind of activity, and they wanted some passenger cars. So that's what we think that's from. And here you can really see the counterweights on the side, especially on this side. And here's a good shot of how they loaded. So they had an engine, and then these idler cars, these are flat cars with no load. That's to keep the engine off the apron. Uh, this particular shot is unique because we rarely put an engine on the barge either. 
And we think this is around 1962 when the uh, Portosuelo Tunnel was lit on fire by a, a bunch of erstwhile teenagers. And that collapsed what our activity was going north. So we had what was called the horseshoe route. We would go from Tiburon around to Larkspur, across the Y. So if you know where Nordstrom is, there was a big Y there that you could go over to Larkspur and back down to Sausalito. That was the horseshoe route. And so that's where that is. And here's the other end that was built for us. This is Pier 43 in San Francisco. And it looks really nice. It's got a nice facade. But behind that facade are gallows wheels and weights and all kinds of stuff. And uh, they let the tracks kind of go. It looks like that today. So, uh, but that's the other side. So this is uh, around 1943, somewhere around there. Uh, so this is our trestle, 750 feet long. But you notice this big pad here. It's much bigger than a home. That was going to be a munitions holder. So we have Belveron East, which is right here. These pads are all for homes. You see they're pretty normal. These pads up here are for munitions, bombs, and other things that could blow up. And uh, here's the old way to get into town, coming down Greenwood Cove and then going down this way. And here's Trestle Glen, kind of a new road there. Tell them about the letter that uh, residents of the oh yeah, peninsula uh, received. So I'm still searching for somebody who has one of these letters. But on August 22nd, 1945, every resident of Tiburon got a letter from the War Department that said, you must vacate your homes immediately. We're going to turn all of Tiburon Peninsula into a military reservation. It was basically going to be another Port Chicago, a lot of ammunition, etc. And the folks in Ignacio got the letter two weeks before that. And by the time the folks here got the letter, Ignacio had packed up and people got rid of their homes. It was a terrible thing. Uh, the World War II ended September 5th, I think. And everybody said, never mind. So if anybody has someone who was here during World War II who got the letter, I'd love to get a copy of it. Uh, this shows our trestle, but this is Blackie's pasture here. So that was all, we call it a swamp, but it, we call it wetlands, I guess, today. <laughs> and so that's what it was. But it got filled in when they changed the highway and when they built these pads for the uh, uh, homes. So this is Meredith Lindman. Is Meredith here? Sometimes she comes. Anyhow, she's a resident of the town, uh, much younger there. And uh, she's waving at the train. Uh, uh, she still lives in her mother's house uh, on Tiburon Boulevard in about the same place. Uh, so she was a regular fixture waving at the train engineers. And you'll note uh, this is a good picture showing the oil stack versus the diamond-shaped stack for the wood burners. And here's the water tank near the Hobo Junction, I believe, close to it. I think, Peter, you can comment on that as to if that's correct or not. <laughs> he disavows. He disavows. Uh, and then we have the end, basically. So the roundhouse is pretty much gone, but the tracks are still there, and the turntable is there. This is our new building for the machine shop. I like this guy sitting here just eating his lunch, whatever he's doing there. By the way, to give you an idea how big this yard was, back in the day prior to this, the original machine shop that burned in the big fire, um, they could build everything and anything, including a locomotive in that shop. They couldn't pour the castings. They chipped the big heavy pieces around the cape, and then they would assemble them here. But they could build box cars and did all the cars that they did, uh, the locomotives, tenders, all that could be built in our shops. And here's our favorite 44 tonner. So we were given in 1947 a diesel engine to play with so we could get used to them. We didn't dieselize till 1953, but this gave us kind of a 
practice. And here it is, loaning cars on here. Uh, these, when I saw the cars, they had stripes on them. We used to call them zebra cars. And the reason they changed to the stripes is somebody uh, s s drove their car straight into the side of these. How you could miss that is pretty difficult, but they did. So they changed them to the zebra car. Now there is 112 yeah. uh, post uh, bath, and you notice it's black. Uh, you also can see the standard stack, and this is before they tartar her up. And I think the next picture actually shows her with her new paint job. Yeah, it does. It's yeah. not in color, but you can see the front is silver, the the the, t the main uh, boiler is is green, and then the cab, as I recall, is gold. Is it not? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty ugly. I don't know why they did this. And these all these chaps down here are patting themselves on the back for having done such a wonderful job in restoring uh, 112. So we'd love to have that engine here, but it's hard to hide something that's 80 feet long and 15 feet high anywhere in Tiburon. So <laughs> uh, this is 1955. So uh, we have some, um, I guess we call it macadam, but it's, it's somewhat paved, Tiburon Boulevard. Uh, here's the old Tiburon Boathouse that Mary McDonough owned. And here's Sam's over here, right here. We had an automobile repair shop on Main Street, the bank building, it's still there. So this is all uh, how we looked, kind of uh, no sidewalks as such. You walked along the road. And then here's later when we moved the building off. We lost 35 feet of it, so that's our building right there. Here's the two little piers that you can see today. And here's the remainder of the slip. This stayed until 1974. Here's the viaduct. So you could walk across to Mar West Street from downtown across the rail yard. Uh, it was famous for having shrunken boards so the gaps were about three inches wide as you walked across and stared down looking at the trains underneath. And there was a th that viaduct was used also for uh, kids who lived on the rail yard to get up to school. And they didn't like it because they had to go about an extra half mile to go, go to the viaduct yeah, and over the top up to the school. So they tried to cut across the rail yard. And if the rail yard detectives caught them, it, w it was probably the last time they would consider doing that. And of course, uh, it was, it was they were pretty rough. But uh, so they all had to go across that uh, viaduct to get, get to school in the morning. So here's the beginning of the uh, Belvedere Lagoon area here. So this is probably 1942 or so. Uh, World War II stopped the development and then it was finished after the war was ended. Uh, but that's Peninsula Road is being shown here. And no, I don't think there's any houses yet. And here's in San Rafael. So th in that era, uh, the trains didn't come out of here and they didn't come out of Sausalito. They started in San Rafael. So when you bought a ticket at the ferry building, you took a Greyhound bus ride up to San Rafael. Later, it was moved up to Santa Rosa. So then you got a Greyhound bus ride from San Francisco up to Santa Rosa. Then you got on the train. And this is either Borden's or Coca-Cola. I'm not sure. I didn't see a sign there. So. And, and one thing that we really kind of bypassed, what killed the railroad? The Golden Gate Bridge. Um, for passengers especially, and when the passenger traffic went away, we still had a very good freight business, but we didn't have the big 80, 80 ton semi rig trailer, tractor trailer rigs that we have today. And when they came in, uh, it just eroded all of the business for the railroad. There still is a Northwestern Pacific Railroad. For those of you who drive up to Napa and you go along the highway at 8th Street, uh, there's, you'll look in there, you'll see a couple of big diesel locomotives, and that's the NWP, and they supply grain, feedstuffs, et cetera, for the dairy farmers on, the, uh, on West Marin. So this is an excursion uh, run by Belvedere Tiburon Landmark Society. Uh, I think it's 
based on that diesel, probably 1962. But it's got a good view of the tunnel way over there. Mr. Russell is still there. Very high over there. Well, it's up in the hill, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whoops, what happened? Oh, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. So I mentioned that the Thurman family owned part of the tunnel to Corte Madera. They also have a trestle in their backyard, and that's still there. And that's just part of their decoration of the, the backyard. Uh, here's another shot of the, the trestle and a, bit a good shot of the tunnel. So if you try to see it today, the f facade is still there, but it's overgrown tremendously with all kinds of plants and stuff. And here's one of the last trains coming through that tunnel. And this is 60s? Tiburon, late 50s. Yeah. I recognize a 59 Oldsmobile uh, station wagon. So yeah, and you, you can begin to see homes up on the side of the hill. And here's our trestle. If you go on the trestle trail today, this bulkhead is still there. And the rest, we have 40 feet of real track and then 500 feet of train. So this is one of the trains, probably not the last one, one of the later ones, uh, taking freight on the horseshoe route. This, we think, is the last train coming out of there. So it's 38 feet from here to the bottom. So if you were running across there and you tripped and fell, that's a pretty big jump. And here's how the rail yard looks today. It's all condos, tennis courts. That's what we have today. And there's our building, and there, more. So this is Mar West Street back here, and all these are built on the rail bed. So the rail bed is the only solid ground in this area. So this area over here is actually uncompressed uh, ground. So if we get a really bad shaker, this building could float out to Hawaii. And that's our building. Uh, it's interesting. We had 35 feet going this way, and there was a roof line that went up like this and down like this and three windows. All that's boarded over now. And that was our flagpole. So flagpole has a little story behind it because it was a flagpole that ran on the administration building, which was used as an office building after this top was converted to housing. And so we added 12 feet to the pole to give it to the same height as it was on the administration building, and that's where it is. And there's our open sign. That's our museum. This is what we started with, clean slate. Uh, it was uh, a lot of work to make it into something that would be a museum. And those are the posts that were added to support the second floor. And now we'll take a little tour of the, the model itself. So these are almost look like real photos, but they are the model with the boat and the slip. <coughs> look at the water. You know, that looks like the water in the front there. We have two waters on the model. One is the bay, and the other one is the fetid uh, pond. Uh, where the houseboats and all sat around, and they threw their sewage and garbage and everything in that pond. Yep. Uh, and you see rowboats. I can't imagine wanting to take a rowboat across that thing. But And just some more. Fueling up. There's a roundhouse. There's our building with the extra 35 feet on it. And ocean-going boats. And in the slip to unload cars. These are the wheels as they were here at the library on the corner over there. And so we actually took them and sealed them in uh, automobile frame preserving paint. It uh, lasts for 100 years. Uh, eventually, a cast iron wheel will turn to dust over time. So uh, we've got it pretty well sealed at this point. You notice they have chains around them. <laughs> 
the big ones that I can't imagine, but I think the chains are for the little ones, as Phil said. People steal. The yeah. little ones walk away yeah. or roll away. Here's where they are put in place. And that's it. And that's our story.